Welcome to the ATP Project. You're with your hosts, Matt, Steve, and we've got Craig, a special guest today, Craig Weller. Now, now I'm going to introduce Craig quickly here because he's got a resume as long as my arm. Now, Craig, um, you know, you, you are an expert master coach of precision nutrition. Um, you're a PN master coach is what the title is. You're in the Navy SWAC, which stands for Special Warfare Combat Crewman. You've been, you're a worldwide personal protective uh, service. You're a certified personal trainer, National Strength and Conditioning Association coach, etc., etc., etc. But what I find most amazing about you is you joined the Navy in 2002 and you didn't even know how to swim. So do you want to talk a little bit about yourself and just take it from there, just to throw you under the bus a little bit there? Tell us about that. Yeah, so I, I grew up in a, a small town in South Dakota in like the middle of America and kind of flatland. Um, the town I grew up in had 800 people in it, and it was like the larger town in that that area. Um, so they had a little swimming pool, but it was like a splishy splash, splishy splash kiddie pool, not the kind like an Olympic pool that you'd actually swim in. Um, so I never like swimming was never part of my world. It wasn't really something that I learned how to do. And the idea that people would use it as a form of transportation to like go somewhere, you know, like I'm going to swim for several kilometers in a straight line was mm. seemed impossible to me. Um, and I was growing up, like I was like the, the bored smart kid in school. And I was really disenfranchised with, with like the conventional education system. So I wanted to do something that would give me a real challenge. Um, like I taught myself, I was really small as well growing up. I was like really skinny and, uh, I learned how to become physically strong. So I went from being this scrawny little kid, the smallest guy in the football team to deadlifting, like I'm trying to convert into metric system, like 200 some kilos by the time I was out of high school. Um, I was physically strong, but I I also realized that, yeah, I was pulling like a 405 deadlift outside of high school, 405 pounds. Um, I realized that strength was not just a physical thing, like physical strength in itself didn't matter that much. So I wanted to do something where I could test and develop strength in a bigger sense, like mental and emotional strength. And I, I underestimated how much this would suck, but I, I picked the <laughs> Navy specifically because I figured that that going into a program where I didn't know how to swim and I was going to have to like build the airplane on the way to the ground was was the best way to sort of hit bottom and really push myself physically and mentally and emotionally. And and it did exactly that. Um, it was it was pretty awful consistently throughout that experience, at least as any time I was in the water. I, uh, I, I had to take the initial screen test was just a 500 meter swim. And I learned how to swim by taking that screen test, like the minimal physical standards that, that you have to meet in order to enter the program. You have three tries or you did at the time. And I would go in and fail it pretty much immediately on my first two, which gave me enough time to get sent to stroke development, to learn how to swim for the remainder of that time period. And then I passed it on my last try by seven seconds. And from there, like squeaked my way into the pipeline and uh, had had a rough go of it and spent about two and a half years in the pipeline before I finally graduated. And I was in the program, as you said, called SWIC, which is the, the boat guys in the Navy or Special Warfare Combatant Crewmen, which is a special operations unit that works with small boats for the most part. Um, and I was in the selection pipeline for that. I was about two weeks from graduating and failed a time swim, surprisingly and got rolled out and had to start over at the beginning. But before I did that, they rolled me into me and my swim buddy into a BUDS program. So into the SEAL training pipeline in a program called the Brown Shirt Rollbacks. So I spent four months there as a SEAL student in the BUDS program, um, learning to swim. And it was the first place where I had real performance coaching because this program was designed to help people who were past Hell Week in the BUDS environment, um, but had either an injury or a performance deficit. So guys who fail to swim or fail to run, but had the the mental raw material to make it through Hell Week, or at least in my case, they knew I wasn't going to quit from being a SWIC student and being two weeks from graduation. And it was there that I had real performance coaching for the first time. Instead of just some guy telling me to just try harder or just swim harder, uh, I had a coach who looked at me swim and gave me at least 10 specific things to do better. And within two months, I passed that swim that I failed in order to get rolled out by over 10 minutes. Um, wow. I dramatically improved. And, and it was not about physical effort because the physical effort was always there. It was about the quality of the coaching, the quality of the instruction and the feedback. 
Um, from there, I went back to the start and started SWIC selection again and graduated as a SWIC um, after, yeah, two and a half years in the pipeline. And that started me down a journey of trying to understand what it is that makes people resilient or makes people capable of succeeding in these kind of environments. Because while I was in, while I was in that pipeline, I saw literally thousands of people fail who all swam better than I did, at least at some point. Um, so it wasn't, you know, guys coming in that were division one athletes who had been competitive triathletes, water polo players, whatever, their, their physicality alone wasn't enough to get them through. Um, so I became really interested in like the total picture of what it is that makes someone succeed in a place like that. And that, that sort of set the rest of, that was a lot of what I did in, in the Navy after that in the special operations world. And then that's what I did, started doing as a civilian as well and my own businesses and then with precision nutrition. And coaches, I mean, did that change your opinion on different types of coaches? I can imagine, and this is purely imagining from like movies and stuff of what I might have seen. I can imagine a drill sergeant, you know, I can imagine the Navy training. It would have been a lot of, you know, yeah, like you're saying, go harder, go faster, more intensity, try harder, you know, trying to motivate you through either, you know, fear or whatever, or I don't know, but like just basically saying go harder as opposed to, the performance coaches that would have actually, instead of just trying to yell at you to do more with more intensity, more angst, more aggression and more emotion, actually coming back and breaking it down into more of a technique or giving you some simple steps. Was that, was that a turning point and did you, were there significant differences in the different types of coaches or I don't know if they're called coaches, I suppose, but you know, instructors or whatever? It's, it is a lot of coaches actually, because you'll see sort of that same phenomenon where people say you were a professional athlete or you were really good at a sport and then you go and coach that sport. You don't necessarily know what made you good at it. Um, you know, like if you're in a conventional sport, you probably did have some formal coaching where there was like explicit mental models that you followed. Um, but what happens in the special operations world is these guys make it through basically just as a matter of statistical chance they're in the 10% that have what it takes to get through. They don't know what those things are. They couldn't explicitly say them. And, and then they become the instructors and they're yeah. teaching other people how to get through, but mm. they don't know what it was that allowed them to get through. So yeah. they can only generally explain in outcomes. They can say things, it would be the equivalent of a track coach saying just run faster, but they can yeah. say things like the advice I had, just try harder, just put out more, just swim harder. I mean, my resting mm. heart rate was in the low 30s. You could see my heartbeat through my shirt. Um, I, it wasn't a lack of aerobic fitness, but, but mm. these were guys who couldn't explicitly say what it was that enabled that outcome. Like if you tell someone to just run faster or just swim faster or try harder, that's useless unless you're able to explain the thing that comes before that. Like what is mm. it that allows you to run faster or try harder or just not quit or whatever? And once you start looking past just the outcome, it gets a lot more complicated and and yeah that's that's where i think you see the division between a good coach and and someone who's just i don't maybe a former athlete or someone who made it by chance who's just saying the same outcomes that worked out for them yeah it's amazing isn't it because because in your book you've, you've got a great book out at the moment I, I think it was released this year called building the elite which i've read the, the first chapter for i haven't read the whole book I, I must admit but wow what a story you know that you, you go into all sorts of things and i guess the the theme of the book and i'm going to guess here so you might have to elaborate is about building an elite athlete which is all about going further and and so you've got to meet, meet people where they're at so if they can't swim you can't talk about elite you can't say go faster so how, how does um this book contrast with you know, um, coaching, uh, I'll say, normal people that are just wanting to lose a few pounds for summer? Well, the principles that are in that book do apply universally. I mean, we use training special operators as is the goal there. That's, that's who we're talking to. But everything that we outline from um, complexity thinking and systems thinking to skill acquisition, stress inoculation, motor learning, uh, mental skills, all of those things, those are universally applicable, whether you're trying to be a special air service guy or an SAS guy or, um, you know, an accountant, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, the same, the same skill sets will apply. You're just, you're just applying those principles in a different environment. Um, it's kind of the way nutrition works. You know, you can be an Olympic athlete or you can be someone who just wants to be healthy and play in the park with your kids. 
either person is just eating broccoli. Like in either case, it's, it still comes down to the same fundamental principles. You're just doing them in a different setting. That's incredible, isn't it? With yep. that, that precision nutrition thing, one of the things I really liked about it, um, I've seen quite a few, um, yeah, there's a lot of people out there with their little training and coaching and online programs and that sort of stuff. A lot of them talk about, again, I'm going to go back to that same thing where there's that all or nothing kind of attitude that if you're not getting the results, it's because you're not swimming fast enough or hard enough. You know, like it's just try harder. It's that motor, you, you're you're, you're um, lacking motivation or you're not doing things with enough intensity. You know, um, one of the things I really found impressive with the precision nutrition is there's there's a seems to be a bit more of acknowledgement in regards to that something is better than nothing. Um, that ideally, you know, going all in with intensity for certain personality types and certain types of people, you'll get, of course, you'll get better results. Um, but there's also there's that other group where doing a little bit of something is better than nothing and um even just and there's weird little the data that's come out from what you've got i i I spun out because i read a just a meme or one of those posts you had on instagram where said one of the reasons one of the reasons why people are failing in their objective to lose weight was that they eat too fast and there was all these weird little things like that that i found very fascinating rather than it was just you know, you're lying to me or you're sneaking food or you're not training hard enough. There's all these other elements of little techniques and stuff. And, and you mentioned in your, your notes there about if you lack motivation, then maybe build routine. You know, mm. um, I really found it quite interesting to see that there's a lot of ways that we can motivate people just to do something. And that's a good place to start. Um, it doesn't have to be full angst and intensity. Is that a, a theme that you've noticed with the everyday person as opposed to the, your experience with like um, that intense, you know, Navy feels and swick stuff. Is it the everyday athlete, uh, the everyday person? <laughs> Is there little tips and tricks that we can get them just to get them to change and start to do something, you know? Yeah. And I think, I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions between say an elite performer, if you're talking about an SAS guy or, um, you know, the, in research, what they'll call the non-elites, like the conventional troops or the Olympic athlete versus the, you know, normal gym goer or someone who's just trying to get in shape. Um, the people who are in the conventional side or, or the normal gym goer sides, I think it's really common to assume that the people who are on the elite side, the Olympic guys or the SAS guys are highly motivated all the time. Like they're just driven by this internal force where they always really want to do the things that they're doing. And, and uh, there's also, I think it's really easy to, to underweight or, or neglect how much work and boredom and grinding it takes to get into these positions. Like if, if you're an Olympic athlete or if you're, a professional fighter, or if you're an SAS operator or someone like that, the amount of just repetitive boredom and suffering that it took to get there never makes it into the highlight reels. Like people really yeah. uh, underscore that. But but the truth is that most of those people aren't motivated from moment to moment. Like nobody's mm-hmm. motivated to get up at three o'clock in the morning and go get go get beat up in the water or go grind through a terrible workout or go do just about anything. I mean, like parents with newborns aren't motivated to wake up at two o'clock in the morning and take care of their kid. Like there are a lot of things that you just do because it has to be done. Um, Motivation gets you started generally. um, But the people who rely on motivation for sustenance or, or for maintenance or to keep going are generally the ones who fall by the wayside. And the guys, the high performers, the guys who are the SAS operators or whatever, are the people who keep going and keep doing the thing that needs to be done, even when that's the very last thing they feel like doing. So they're, they're people who manage to put the behavior that they're after in front of their moment-to-moment feelings. So, so they, they put behavior first, whether they feel like it, whether they're motivated or not, they still do the right thing, even when the right thing is hard and discouraging and and exhausting to do mm. yeah so it's like a so the routine aspect of it so it's because i yeah i never thought about it like that because normally mm. with these sort of scenarios it's 
again, I, I seem to refer to movies a fair bit, but the, you know, the montages with the cool music soundtrack over it. I mean, in the real world, they don't have that, do they? It, this, this slog and the grind, it doesn't necessarily have the rocky music drive. They're not out there fired up thinking about, they're just actually getting up and doing what has to be done. Yeah, and that's actually what, like the physical test that you see in in special operations selection, like it's a very rigorous process. Um, but but in combat, in any of these jobs, you're never going to like out push up the enemy. You're never going to have a two mile swim race or or any other timed physical event. No one's ever going to care how many pull ups you can do once you're an active duty operator, like it's never going to come up in your job. But yeah. those those physical tests are a way of revealing who that person is when nobody's watching. Because you can't be capable of those things when you show up unless you were doing a lot of work previously when nobody was watching and nobody was making you do it. So mm -hmm. all those physical tests are just a way of revealing what's inside somebody's head, like who they are as a person. So you're seeing some level of conscientiousness. You're seeing delayed gratification or impulse inhibition, self-discipline and internal locus of control. So there's someone who, who feels like they play an active role in shaping the world rather than having the perspective of someone where the world just happens to them. Um, and that's what's largely revealed by all these physical tests. And then you're also seeing how someone handles an explicit stressor that's likely to make them panic. Like that's why a lot of these courses use water. Because uh, if you make somebody really mm. hypoxic, uh, mm. it's like a direct path to panic in your brain. Like in, in lab rats or in animals where they want to test panic, if they build up the CO2 levels in the blood of, of a rat running through a maze, it will actually sometimes just run through barriers rather than around them. Because it's such a, a strong panic reflex when you feel like you're suffocating. Um, and so, so people aren't actually that interested in how long you can hold your breath. Like, again, you're not going to be in a combat situation and then have a breath holding competition with somebody, but they want to see what you do when you're in a situation where you're extremely prone to panic and they want to see your capacity for self-regulation and, and your, your ability to calm yourself down and stay functional and, and fluid under stress. And all of the physical fitness stuff that you see, that's what it's about. They're not they're not trying to recruit a bunch of people to win CrossFit competitions or something like that. They're just using physical testing to unveil psychological traits. Yeah, right. it's amazing. It's, I mean, you, you wrote an article to it. it. It's motivation gets you started and here's what keep you going. Even when you feel like giving up, I won't quote it, but there's an absolutely fantastic quote in it, which it says, um, you know, as it turns out where you start is far less important than when you're willing to go and and i love that line because you know you you could be way behind the eight ball if you're trying to go you know, your fitness you could be not being able to swim or anything like that but where you're willing to go is is a really powerful sort of phrase and i just wonder if you could elaborate on that and 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 reference it to one of your clients you've had about some that have done amazing transformations like we've seen on the precision nutrition um a website where they said there was a guy I was looking at yesterday and Matt said oh you're looking at naked guys well um and he was shirtless and he was he was absolutely I'll have to say I won't be harsh but he was very out of shape and then a year later he was very in shape he wasn't just better he was excellent um so so there's some incredible results you get so I love that term willpower I just wonder if you could elaborate on people how to sort of impart that sort of um I don't know motivation on them and, and willpower Have you got any tips for that I think we have a strong, it's kind of a cliche thing, but we have a strong tendency to overestimate what we can do in the short term and underestimate what we can do in the long term. Um, like as a kid, I was always fascinated by stories like um, the Shawshank Redemption, where the guy eventually tunnels his way out and carves himself a chest set out of rocks. Uh, after or, 30 years, um, I think. Yeah, you know, like those kind of stories, I, I, The Count of Monte Cristo, I, I love those kind of things where people take a long time to do something that that can only be accomplished with a ton of time and patience um and that's the same thing we see yeah with our clients at pn uh and interestingly you can kind of see who who has it and who doesn't early on like in the first month or so it starts to reveal itself um but but people i think due to the problems that the fitness industry creates for itself by promising a lot of you know, 28 day transformations and, mm -hmm. and four, four a week miracle diets and whatever, um, <laughs> six minute abs. 
uh, we, we've conditioned people to think that everything should happen really quickly. And, and that's, it's not really someone's fault if that's what you're expecting, because it's what the entire fitness industry has told you for your entire life. Um, but it's not how it works. Not really. And, and it's, it's the people who are able to patiently work through a process and, and focus on the inputs into that process and, and building, like you were saying, the habits, the routines, the behaviors um, that support their long-term goals that, that make those dramatic transformations by the end of the year. Um, it's not at all about any individual heroic effort. It's not the guy who's crushing himself in the gym with like a really terrible single workout. It's just the person who's showing up every day. Um, and, and doing a little bit of work, even if it's imperfect and it's just gradually improving, um, because those improvements compound over time. And it's, I don't know, it's something about our brains. We're not very good at understanding or, or I don't know, predicting what something's going to do after a year of doing it. It's harder to think that way. You know, we, we like to think of how much different we're going to feel in a week or two weeks or something like that. And that's kind of where we, where we forecast and where we put our horizons, but, but yeah, at PN, we work with people for a year and it's for that reason, because that gives us enough time to account for the ups and downs that they're going to have and, and build some more resilient habits with them to where the skills that we're giving them become unconscious competencies. They, they go from something that you're always thinking about where you have to use willpower and conscious thought to make it happen to just the thing you naturally do. And I think that's another one kind of going back to that difference between like the normal people and the elite kind of guys um, or the elite kind of people that our decisions don't just reveal our preferences, they also shape them. So even if it takes willpower and conscious override at first, if we get ourselves to put the behavior before our feelings and we do the things that we're not motivated to do for a while, that starts to shape our preferences and our feelings or our secondary emotions, like our, our motivations in the future. So if we choose those things enough, then over time it becomes our default preference. And then it becomes easier, like, like you build momentum. Um, but initially it doesn't work that way. Initially you just feel negative feedback and, and you feel a lot of inertia resistance and, and pretty much any change that takes you out of your comfort zone, um, is aversive and, and you'll feel some pull to avoid it. Um, but if you manage to do that for even a fairly small amount of time, it starts to become easier. And I think it's forecasting into those longer term, um, habit or routine building kind of things that, is where we we have the most capacity to change and where it seems like most of the time we struggle the most to understand or the most we struggle the most to see um so because we are the sum of our consistent actions so the the key so what i'm hearing here is it's not all about you know like a lot of people think i've got to do stuff with such intensity that if i just don't feel as i've got that in me i just won't do it today um, so they're still better off turning up and doing something anyway. I mean, if you if you're not capable of doing the eighty to hundred percent intensity on that day, then even if you just turn up and you're just feeling flat, but you still go through the motions and you do your sixty to eighty percent intensity, keeping that consistent routine and keeping that consistent pattern is probably more important than the intensity of the particular event. Would you say that that's something you've noticed with um, your clients? Yeah. And you could think of that as a, as a meta skill as well. Like that's a conversation I had a lot of, with a lot of my clients. Um, like say you, you're just, you're tired. It's been a long day. You don't feel like working out at all. You know, you you know that if you go do the workout, it's probably not going to be at that 80 to hundred percent level. And, and you put yourself into that binary all or nothing thinking, um, and you skip the workout because it's not going to be a great workout. So why bother? But if we look past the immediate short-term adaptations that you're making with a workout, like if we look past mitochondrial density and motor units and glycogen or whatever, um, and we look at the things we're really changing because all of those physiological adaptations from one workout to another are going to be gone, are going to fade within seven to 21 days, typically, depending on the energy system. Like they don't stick around for that long unless you reinforce them over and over. Um, but in the bigger picture, 
there, there's sort of a meta skill that you're developing where let's say you feel terrible and you go do a workout anyway. All you tell yourself is you're going to do the warm up, and you get through the warm up, and then you manage a little bit more. You do some squats, you do a couple of heavy things, and then you get out because yeah, you're tired, and it's just you probably don't have the adaptive capacity to benefit from a really intense workout, but you did something. If you step back five years from now and think of what you got from that workout or what you built, it had nothing to do with mitochondria and glycogen. It, it had to do with cognitive skills or emotional biases. Mm. And, and you trained this meta skill of consistency, of doing something even when you didn't feel like it, and of, of putting the desired behavior that's, that's associated with your long-term goals in front of the fluctuations of your moment-to-moment -moment emotions or feelings. Um, and that, that sort of meta skill of consistency or perseverance or whatever you want to call it is probably a lot more beneficial than whatever physiological adaptations you may have gotten from that workout, because those sort of subcognitive skills play a major role in shaping who you are in the long term. Like the changes you make in your glycogen levels or motor unit recruitment or whatever, that matters a week from now. That's going to be important. But if we look at the behaviors or the things that compound over years and years on a larger time scale, a lot of those things are those, those meta skills or the subcognitive skills like consistency or perseverance or whatever you want to call it. Um, so yeah, if you, if you step back from, should I do this workout or not because I'm tired and, and you think about the longer term implications of, of what you're developing as sort of an embodied value system as, as how your behaviors reflect the person you want to be and the decisions that you want to feel impelled to make in the future, then that decision in the moment of do I do this workout or do I at least do part of it or not um, is viewed a lot differently. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. You, you wrote another article that I love to called turning exercise into fun because a lot of people don't like exercise or have a strong resistance to it, have all the excuses in the world. But having fun seems like a pretty universal thing that everyone wants. So I'd love you to talk about that aspect of, of that article you wrote, which was, was just, I found terrific. Yeah, and that's, there, there are two sides to that, I think, because, I mean, fitness gets sold easily as something that should be fun all the time, as if that's its primary purpose. And that's not always the case. Like, you know, if you're, if you're talking about being a professional athlete or being a special operator or someone like that, a lot of what you're going to have to do is not going to be fun. But um, at the same time, I, our, our culture has sort of taken the joy out of physical movement and, and we've uh, like constrained it to this sort of weird artificial world where everything happens on basically hamster toys inside this fluorescent lit room where you're just counting numbers and repetitions. And generally it's all punishment based. And you're, you're thinking about like how many calories am I burning or how long do I have to be here in order to justify drinking later or, or whatever terrible thing. And, and it's, it's just all aversive. It's, it's constantly forcing yourself to do something that's at least mildly unple unpleasant and probably boring. And, and I think, that in itself is, is extremely harmful too. Um, like I think about a lot of the workouts that I did as, as a special operator downrange with all the, the SWIC guys, um, like one of the, my favorite ones that we did, we lived on an Island in, uh, in Southeast Asia and we would run around on the beach. We had, we dug up a couple of like fairly large boulders about the size of a rugby ball, maybe. Um, and we would do relays in teams where we would take turns throwing the, these boulders down the length of the beach until we got to a certain point. And then we would swim them out through the surf zone under the waves and out to where we had our boats anchored so that we we're in teams of two. And the one guy would be carrying the rock on the bottom of the ocean on the, on the sand. And his buddy would be swimming above him, watching to make sure he doesn't pass out. And then he'd set the rock down and swim for the surface and get a breath and you take turns and you just relayed the rock out so you got to the boat and then you would put it in on top of your quads with your hips flexed, like in a pike position and climb the anchor chain or climb the rope that was anchoring the boat and throw the rock up onto the deck of the boat. And that was like the end. And then you'd huck it back in the ocean and try not to hit anybody with it and swim back. And we raced by doing that. And that was our workout. And it was a great workout, but it was really, really fun. Um, <laughs> like it, it was just enjoyable. Mm. And <clears throat> if you look at people who are easily fit, you know, the ones where we're just being 
physically functional and healthy is part of their lives, um, generally they find inherent joy in what they're doing. And a lot of that is probably happening outside of the gym in some way. Like if you're a skier, if you're a jujitsu grappler, if you're doing, if you're a surfer, like most of the sports that, that keep people healthy for a long time, um, are inherently rewarding. And then if you're, if you're doing something with your life that, that doesn't live in the gym, then you're going to use gym exercise as a way of supporting that. So you'll use gym exercise to develop specific physical capacities, to make yourself stronger, to develop an energy system, to correct a movement imbalance, to do something like that. But if you're doing that with the bigger perspective of using that gym training to support something that gives you a much deeper sense of meaning in your life that brings you joy somewhere else, um, I think it's much more likely to be sustainable in the long run and and it's it's generally healthier and there there are physiological reasons for that when you, when you look at just movement variability the energy systems you're using and the um the association that you're making between effort and fatigue or between um physical movement and, and pain or suffering like if you think of somebody hiking in a beautiful mountain range walking up a beautiful mountain for four hours with a heavy backpack they're going to be happy about the work that they're doing. But if you told that same person to go in the gym and do step ups with that backpack for four hours, they'd probably kill themselves. It'd be terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and we spend a lot of time doing the latter version, you know, like, like there are ways to exercise or physically expend your body or train yourself that, that don't have to involve being painfully bored or just suffering through something. And kind of the way the fitness industry works, we, sort of ignore those things. We don't pay as much attention to them. And and I think in that article you're referencing, I was talking about a kid that I was watching me and my wife mm. were at a restaurant in uh, Costa Rica at the beach. And we were watching this little kid like fight Some imaginary girl, yeah. ninjas running around. Yeah. She's like diving over palm trees and ninjas. stuff. And yeah, she was just running everywhere and completely exhausting herself. I think she was playing with her little brother. And, and like, that's how life starts. And then mm. suddenly we find ourselves attached to a desk or sitting in a car in a two hour commute. And we forget about that. And movement is no longer inherently rewarding or joyful. It's, it's this punishment that we do to justify drinking or having ice cream. And yeah. I, I think it's a terrible way to live. It mm. is. And, and you're right though. I mean, you, when you're busy doing stuff like you're functioning or you're trying to get somewhere, it doesn't feel like exercise. You're just going through the motions. I remember we used to go, I used to have this little kayak circuit that we do because I love fishing and we used to go kayaking and drop some crab pots and, you know, that sort of stuff. And then um, and then at the same time, I used to go to the gym and then part of my gym routine was getting onto the rowing machine because I kind of, you know, I think it doesn't hurt that much. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a car the rowing machine. I used to just pump out this rowing machine, be all sweaty and intense and like all that sort of stuff and pull out a couple of kilometers we got onto google maps once and went and shown people where the circuit that i used to paddle the kayak during just before or mm. after work without mm. really thinking it was exercise that was something actually i did because it was fun and i mm. tried to fit it in around and there were days that i didn't go kayaking because i had to go to the gym or something, you know, I ran out of time or something. I got to commit to it. And it turned out that I was doing this like seven kilometer circuit kayaking but yeah. and doing it without even realizing and then walking the kayak to and from the cars and, you know, like there's all these other levels of exercise and intensity in it as well. But the reality is it did not feel like exercise and I didn't, you know, be sore yeah. from it and everything, yeah. but it just happened so fast. It was so much fun. You didn't realize that you're on a kayak for, a, for an hour or so. You know, and the whole time exercising. Mm. Then I go into the gym and I try to do like a kilometre in five minutes or something on a rower and go, oh, man, that's uh, that's real exercise that, because yeah. it wasn't fun. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't fun. It was in a sweat. must have been yeah. exercise because it wasn't fun. Oh, it's just, just incredible, <laughs> that. I mean, the, the fact about having fun. And, of course, children naturally run around and animals naturally run around. You know, you take a dog to a park and it will just go nuts. It won't do it won't do back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, or round, loop, loop, loop. It'll just run all over the place like a child would. And we seem to lose that. So I love that philosophy of turning it into fun. And you, and you mentioned a great one about, um, you know, the kayaking. I did the same sort of thing when you, when you swim, snorkel, looking at, 
at fish and Great Barrier Reefs that we've got here in Queensland, Australia. Uh, you could swim on those things for hours, but I go to the pool, I do 30, 40 minutes of black line up and down, and I'm, I'm out of there, and it's only about a mile. And, you know, you, you, you get 1.6 kilometres, but, I mean, it, it's incredible that, that being able to give those sorts of uh, tricks to people. So, so basically what I'm asking for, is there any sort of tips you'd give to people who are wanting to exercise but don't want to join the gym and do all that sort of thing? Is there something they can do that's sort of, you know, a percentage towards some sort of intense exercise? Is there anything you, you, you tell people regularly to do? Yeah, it's something they can do tomorrow. I like, yeah. I like to give people something that they can take away from it. So can we get some tips of some some things where people can add something where there may have previously been nothing, mm. you know? So, um, I mean, first I would question whether intense exercise is necessary as we understand it. Um, I mean, we have a strong bias towards getting people to do really hard workouts or to deadlift heavy weights or do squats or whatever. Uh, but if you look at research on, say, blue zones, like the longest living, healthiest lifespans in the world, you find a whole bunch of populations of people who don't exercise as we conventionally understand it. They're very physically active. They're they're moving around all day, but they're not they're not picking up a round metal object and setting it back down over and over and counting it. Uh, they're they're just moving, uh, mm-hmm. and I think I think that's probably. If you're not a competitive athlete, if your if your physical performance doesn't earn you a paycheck, um, I would question the need for intense exercise, at least as a primary focus. If you're trying to just get back into movement, if you're trying to just become physically active, um, I would first look for just something that you find rewarding, something where you you inherently enjoy it, at least to some extent. And go do that, and then and then try to do a little bit more of it, um, and and that opens up a lot more possibilities. And and it is, I'm not saying that, that being in a gym can't be fun. Um, that is certainly possible, and and there's usually a social element to that when that's the case. You know, you have some fun training partners. You're in a group that you enjoy. There's a there's a social dynamic or element to it that's rewarding, and and also offers a sense of community and accountability, and that can be really valuable. Um, but if you're just trying to be healthy and live for a long time, the the thing that's going to matter more is enjoyable, uh, just steady, con- regular movement throughout the day, not having a really heavy deadlift or being good at CrossFit or you know having a good Fran time or something like that. Like those are more performance oriented things. They're not longevity and health oriented things. Um, like you can think of one of the things you're developing with with training with exercise is a stress response in the same way that you're, you're deciding, you know, like what your strength level is going to be. You're affecting all these other things that we're used to measuring. You're also building associations with your stress response. And there's a physiological response that is necessary. What, what researchers call the mere physiological demand of an activity. And then there's the emotional stress response that we add to it. There's the coloring that we add through our perspective. And if you're doing something that you inherently enjoy, um, you your your emotional stress response is going to be low you'll you'll have an entirely different perspective and and what's happening in your brain is also happening in your bloodstream uh where if you do something if you do an exercise even if you take the same activity and you just convince someone that it's exercise instead of fun um their emotional stress response that they're associating with that activity with movement changes as well so you have altered levels of epinephrine and cortisol you have you have an association with like the higher sympathetic tone. They're in more of a fight or flight mode and they're associating that with physical movement. Um, and that's not necessarily beneficial. You don't necessarily need a big stress response or a fight or flight response to move your body. Um, but when when we fixate excessively, at least on, on high intensity exercise as the key to fitness, that's what we're teaching people. And then you end up with, I, I work with a lot of athletes who have come up through like kind of CrossFit backgrounds and it's like trying to drive an F1 car in a parking lot. They, they have a really hard time doing anything slow and easy and they have lost their mid range. Like they're not really capable of doing much work at a low to moderate heart rate and they blow up really fast. Um, and the same thing happens with someone who's a normal sedentary person who's just trying to become more active, if they're immediately thrown into intense exercise, um, they'll end up building this association where they're either on or off. 
they're either in a big stress response or they're sitting still and they have a hard time moderating and being somewhere in the middle, which makes regular daily physical activity more difficult. Um, so yeah, sorry, that's not, that's not a super short immediate takeaway, but I think the thing to look for is first, just find something that you enjoy that you can do regularly and, and build that into your life so that you don't need willpower to, to do it on a regular basis, like build something into your routine or your structure, your environment so that that enjoyable thing is also easy to do regularly. Actually, we bought my mother-in-law a dog. That's what, that was one of our solutions ah, for that. For right, my mother-in-law right. needed to walk. We bought our dog. So now she walks five miles a day. Huh. That's a good idea. That is good. So, so what I'm hearing, like so far, um, some of the tips that we, people can take away is that, you know, perhaps routine, um, it's better than motivation. Like you build some routine. Mm. Um, consistency over intensity. Um, it's more important to have some sort of a consistency than consistent intensity. Um, and playing every day sounds really important um, to make it some sort of a playing. Um, like if you get into the habit of playing every day, then your other days, if, if some days you're going to want to do that real intense exercise. You know, when you are motivated mm. to do things with full intensity, that's not overly stressful for you, then you can do those. But on every other day, if you're playing, you're actually doing something where previously you're doing nothing. Um, for those that are sedentary, for those that are sedentary and you know office chair workers and you know, that sort of stuff, um, work out ways of implementing regular activity um, through your day just to break that cycle of sitting for example the, those data they did that in australia they always talk about you know go for a walk for half an hour every day mm. um, and you know that's good for our cardiovascular health but that was based on studies where they got people to walk for five minutes every hour over a six hour period and then they've come back and summarized it at 30 minutes of walking per day we'll cover it so it's easier to do your 30 minutes all at once but mm. In reality, the science showed that the five minutes every hour of just standing up and walking was more important mm. than doing the intense 30 minutes all in one stint. So if we can get these people changing some of their patterns through the day with stand-up desks and moving and walking around instead of calling or whatever, um, get your steps in through the day just as part of your normal activity, there's another way that we can actually start to make some change. Mm. So if we get everyone... You know, make some little rules like play every day like consider that you know for for every hour of sitting we at least contribute five minutes to not be sitting and be doing other things you know that might be some good little rules um really focus on consistency even when you can't do the intensity mm. and that can be achieved through routine yeah. in regards to those sort of like movement things and then the other thing that i wrote down here is that it's important to enjoy whatever exercise you're doing. Um, try to remove some of the stress out of it. I mean, your body really, your brain does not know if it's actually stress, it, you know, if you're in the middle of a survival situation or if you're just training with intensity. Mm. Um, so you don't really want to have be reinforcing those defensive postures every day by thinking that I'm under attack constantly. Mm. So you want to actually be in that free, safe zone where I think we want to be able to exercise without fear of, um, inducing a major stress response every day that's going to be reinforcing you know some of these issues so um, there's a couple of tips what and in, in, re so in regards to like exercise and movement and lifestyle what are some of the other things that you've noticed as uh, we talk all the time about removing handbrakes not just you know pushing the throttle is there any other little tips that we can go like we talk about like if you're not sleeping well you're going to struggle um, in my naturopath clinic what I used to do is try to incorporate you know, as a naturopath, we always told people, you know, we always taught to tell people to avoid, avoid things. You know, it's like mm -hmm. avoid gluten or avoid dairy or avoid this and avoid everything, you know, <laughs> avoid the world, live in a bubble and you'll be fine. But what I preferred to do is give some positive, constructive stuff. So like I'd always leave them on my prescriptions was always at the bottom was like well, the tech people call them macros or something. So I put in these little things that would say, um, you know, always sit down to eat, like never eat on the run. Um, you know, try to savor the food. And I used to tell people to do like positive, before I supplemented with enzymes or anything like that, it was like, just sit down to eat some positive affirmations or however you can basically trick your brain into reminding it that you're about to eat right now. Um, can you think of anything else we can add to our list of positive little tips that we can give people to start on tomorrow? Mm, I think 
I mean, those are some great examples of that. I, I think back to some of the Blue Zone research, again, looking at the, the cultures that have the healthiest, longest disease-free lifespans. And kind of as you're saying, the way that they eat is mm. just as important as what they're eating. Mm. Um, where if you look at um, Sardinian, like Italian culture, or Okinawans, most um, the Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica, they they tra- they're all cultures that traditionally have long meals with friends and family, where regardless of the content of the meals, they're probably spending several hours sometimes hanging out, laughing, and eating multiple courses, savoring and actually tasting the food, and being happy and connected with the people around them as they're eating. Um, and that's yeah, a very different thing than uh, you know wolfing down a burger in your car or in front of the television or something like that. So I, I think uh, one quick takeaway you could take from that is kind of as you're saying, sit down to eat and and have a meal with people that you enjoy being around and and talk to them. <laughs> uh, you know, like like spend some time, turn your phone off, turn the TV off and, and spend some time tasting your food and enjoying the company of the people that are around you and, and make that food a part of a more meaningful, rewarding life than mm-hmm. than just something that you do to make hunger pains go away. That's great. Yeah, that's a, the Mediterranean paradox data. They always for years remember that it's the red wine, or no, it's the olive oil, or no, it's the, the no, it's the three to four hour lunch break, <laughs> where they would actually get out of like the sympathetic nervous system, like into the vagus nerve. Everything's in there. Digestion actually works. We got less cortisol floating around at the same time as such things as insulins and yeah everything's different if our body knows we're about to eat Mm. same with i had those cool data talking about positive affirmations or saying grace depending on what your belief systems and what would work for you they even reduce the degree of allergies and inflammation Mm. from the meal by just getting people to be positive about what they're about to eat Mm. and actually just engaging with that i'm not working right now and the same with like um tradition routine um like when we have a lot of the cultures so whether they're having a soup entree salad entrees they have little teas they have these things that telling their body we're about to eat and then cultures Mm -hmm. that might be religious they'll using things like the grace to say okay we're not working right now yeah and thanks for all that sort of opportunity to get this food on the table but right now we're thinking about food and then they did another the same with the positive affirmations that i'm only taking good things out of this food then focus on the allergies focus on the avoids focus on i'm going to take nutrients i'm going to take colors i'm going to take that so while we're talking about food is there any tips that you've noticed that is there things that we can tell people you know like a do we add more fiber um, is there things that you focus on whole foods or, or are you straight out calories in calories out just do the mass I don't care whether you're eating Maccas you know, eating McDonald's or um, actually eating uh, a proper you know whole food thing do you have opinions on that no I, yeah, I, I definitely bias toward toward whole food I think the whole calories in calories out thing or, or what is that it's always an acronym if it fits your macros yeah yeah, um, yeah. That just needs to go away because it's mm. it's terribly short-sighted thinking. Um, I, yeah, for the most part, I think that's part of why the paleo diet works so well because uh, research is eventually going to pick away at almost every like scientific premise of that. You know, the idea that everyone needs to avoid gluten or or lectins or whatever. That's not really universally true, um, but. Regardless, if you tell someone that they can only eat whole foods and they have to avoid processed foods and they have to avoid foods that have all this crap in it, like processed oils and stuff, like the basic premises of a paleo diet, they end up just eating a whole bunch of unprocessed whole foods or, or yeah. most of them. You know, like there's going to be a lot of people that find paleo cupcakes still, but, but, but it's, it's, it's the whole foods part of that, that, that is probably the most beneficial. Like, that kind of diet is the closest you're generally going to get to the don't eat shitty food diet, which is, yeah. you know, you can kind of divide <laughs> diets between either eat less shitty food, which is if it fits your macros or don't eat shitty food, which is something like paleo or Mediterranean or, or a plant-based diet or something like that, where, where the constraints just limit, they, they constrain you to whole foods. You're going to eat plants and animals and, and things that you can recognize in nature for the most part that, that aren't like made in a laboratory. Um, yeah. And and that that cluster, the middle of the Venn diagram, is is where the useful stuff is found. So if you mm-hmm. take paleo, Mediterranean, plant based diets, whatever, 
and you discard the marketing and you discard the things that make them all unique and different, uh, you know, like the narrative stories about what cavemen probably ate or whatever. And you just look at the things they all have in common. They, they fixate on eating a lot of plants, a lot of vegetables, um, primarily whole foods, an emphasis on omega-3 fatty acids, um, a lot of fiber, as you said. Um, you're avoiding refined omega-6 heavy oils, things like soybean oil, corn oil, stuff like that. All of those diets have that in common. And those are the things that actually matter. And all of those mm. things can be done with any healthy diet, like any diet, mm. paleo, Mediterranean, plant-based, whatever. And, and the rest of it is just marketing. And, yeah, and that's true. And then you could do those. You could do those the evil way as well. I mean, I mean, we, we see the, the bad stats and they always comes out that this is the summaries of pretty much every meta-analysis is processed food is bad for you mm. um yeah so if you if you look at the um you know the vegan i mean you can go vegan you can go plant-based and you could do that through pure processed crap mm. um it could just be nothing but weird modified sugar Potato alcohol chips. starches mm. and oh, oh you know and and it's all wrong and weird the same as you can go full carnivore and spend your whole time eating processed salamis and um, you know, luncheon meats or whatever they call it, that weird reconstituted foods. Yummy stuff. But it's, it's, it's a carnival, you know. So the point is, is you could go any extreme. At the end of the day, the sick people are the ones that focus on the processed foods. The healthy ones are the ones that eat a nice variety of good, clean, fresh stuff. And herbs and spices, I think, are extremely important. Because yeah, sure. when you notice that pattern between the different groups, we find that... Um, the, the carnivore people that are healthy still incorporate certain herbs and spices into those carnivores. Mm. In, they call them flavorings and that sort of stuff. But there's a lot of herbs and spices in there that aren't incorporated as part of the meat. Mm. Same with the plant-based stuff. The guys that are eating the soybean and the gluten you know, processed foods are nowhere near as healthy as the guys that are actually trying to flavor up a variety of foods and incorporate the herbs and spices. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think that's really that's undervalued, the power mm. of... of yeah, herbs and spices, thyme, oregano. And There's some research on that, on how even adding a little bit of rosemary to meat with the, um, mm. I want to say it's advanced glycation, glycated, glycation yep. end products. Yeah, yeah. advanced um, glycosidating products, ages. Mm. Yeah, are, are counteracted by the uh, polyphenols in rosemary. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it, it, it works together if you, if you use it right, yeah. So if you consider that someone then might be incorporating processed meals where they've got sauces and they got all these flavor agents and everything into it and, and along with it comes all these weird chemicals and everything mm. as opposed to the guy that's actually just grinding up herbs and spices and flavoring up their foods using seasonings herbs and spices mm. i mean it's massive difference in my opinion mm. you know as a herbalist too so i'm quite biased and i have an obsession over the gut microbiome and the importance of having such things as yeah, you know, understanding that the gut microbiome to a certain degree will try to determine our body shape and maintain that body shape because it's involved in you know seasonal changes to diets and rebound weight gain. So, I think it's very important that we incorporate things that help to you know, whole foods that regulate our gut as mm. well while we're going through this body composition changes. Do you guys right. in Australia have have you been having uh, a new trend of keto ice cream that's that's just a bunch of sugar alcohol with with flavoring got, in it, yeah. oh, keto and ice cream. It's, every, it's, it's, it's fascinating. So what, like it's weird, hey? They've given us. If you consider that they've somehow managed to convince people that if you urinating out ketones, you're obviously burning fat. Even if I'm feeding you ketones and calories, <laughs> it's like I'm giving you ketones that you're going to wee out, and then convince yourself you're burning fat. And the calories of the sugar alcohols and everything, they're not technically carbs because we've modified them, but mm. They're still providing all these calories just mm. like a carbon. So, yeah, it's like, so it, oh, no, yes, we get it. Like, it's and you're going to huh? eat like 50 grams of xylitol or something with this ice cream. Like, yeah, you're going to lose weight because you shit your pants shit. for two days. That'll do it. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess the reason why they do this is because then people can still cop the, the ice cream and think they're doing well. And, and it really is a little bit of a cop out because they, they, they substitute a bad food, normal ice cream, with another. Equal, not equally, but possibly equally as bad food that makes you feel sick and bloats you and 
gives you diarrhea and all sorts of stuff. And I think it's a, I think people who do that maybe lack motivation where the correct answer would be, hey, how about you just have some normal fruit for dessert or something? And so it's a little bit of a cop out. So motivation, I think, is important to get people to to want to change because, you know, the only way to improve is to change. Now, motivation, you talk about motivation on the website and your motivation is snowshoes. What? Yeah, snowshoes. Snow boots, sorry. Um, not so shoes. You, I love that story. You want to talk about that and talk about motivation to get people to change? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, like, uh, as I said, I grew up in a, a tiny town in, in rural South Dakota. Mm. And uh, my parents, my dad worked at a, he's like a, basically a banker for farmers. He was an ag loan lender. He had an office that was about a mile from our house. And my mom is a paramedic. Uh, so she was always on call. We had two cars, two vehicles, and my mom needed one because she was always on call. And then we had the second one and my dad would start work way before we went to school, like 7 a.m. maybe. And and in South Dakota in, in the winter, it's brutally cold, like multiple feet of snow and the sun is gone and and it's super windy. Like wind is the other part of it. Like the snow drifts will cover highways and or highway overpasses uh, and uh and my dad would leave the second car, the second vehicle for me and my, my siblings. My, I have two brothers and a sister so that we could comfortably drive to school in the morning. And at 7 a.m. before the sun was even up, he would trudge to work, walk this mile or so to his office and, and then work all day. And he would do that by wearing these really heavy snow boots, like the kind that come up almost to your knee so that the snow doesn't get inside of them. And then at the end of the day, he would come home, take those boots off at the door and set them by the door and, and the snow would melt off him in a little puddle and, and that would repeat itself for my entire childhood. <laughs> um, and as I was going through selection, uh, I, I had pretty much two and a half years of, of bad days to, to make it through. Um, like, especially when I first started, the furthest I'd ever swam was passing the screen test was 500 meters. And I think this, we had this workout that started with, I think it was a 2000 meter swim as oh, a yeah. warm up, <laughs> And we, we, we did that. We did that. We did the swim and I was dying when we got out. And, and then from there it proceeded into maybe another hour, at least of freestyle races where you'd swim down a lap lane. And then if you got past, you had to get out and do a bunch of push ups and then jump back in and, and sprint the next lap lane. And you just did that over and over and over. And every time I thought it was going to be over and it was our last one, we'd enter the water, do it again. And I, I got to where I was blacking out in the water. Like I would close my eyes or I'd blink and then they just stay shut. And I'd, I'd like kind of jump back to consciousness floating under the water a little bit. And then I'd cough my way and sputter and start swimming again. And at the end of it, I couldn't pull myself out of the water under my own power. Like my friends had to grab me by the wrists and drag me out of the pool, like a beach whale sort of. And then I kind of crawled on my hands and knees to the back of the line and took my time getting up and, and was standing there with my hands on my knees. Like, and I, I, Thought I was going to drown if, if we did it again. And finally the workout ended and they, they, they called us out of the water. And like, that was one of dozens at least of workouts that were at least that bad. Um, and I, I, like I lived on maybe the fifth floor, fourth or fifth floor of a barracks and we had to take stairs. There's no elevator. And after those kind of workouts, I'd walk home and I'd, I'd, I'd have to take the stairs in, in steps, like in like one flight at a time. So I'd go up one flight of stairs and then I'd sit on the floor on the landing after the first flight, drink some water and rest because I wasn't physically able to make it up the, the five flights all at once. So I'd have to do them a little bit at a time. I'd make it to like the third flight and then I'd sit down on the floor and just be in kind of a pile of sadness, <laughs> sitting there breathing, drinking water, thinking about my life and, and you know, people are walking by looking at me. And I finally make it up to and get home for the day and, and be done and go do it again. And I, I dreaded it so much. Like the nights before, sometimes I would throw up a time or two because I was so anxious about the beating I was going to take the next day that, that I just, I dreaded it. And I, I get up at three o'clock in the morning, every morning to do this. And at least for the first year, it was 3 a.m. And, uh, during those, the, the absolute worst moments, like there's, there's a lot of little motivational tricks you can use. Um, little skills and stuff, but, but when everything else is gone and you're kind of, you've even lost almost the ability to consciously think and, and you don't have much else to hold on to. the image that I had that allowed me to keep going 
was my dad's snow boots sitting by the door, melting snow off of them. Um, because I saw those snow boots as representing every sacrifice that my parents had made for me over the course of 18 years so that I could have a better life, so that I could have opportunities and I could go out and make something of myself. And every time I was just having a terrible day and, and I thought about choosing to quit, like deciding to just end it and, and be comfortable, I thought about those snow boots and I thought about that 18 years of sacrifices and I could not fathom making that phone call and calling my dad and tell him that I gave up because it was too hard despite everything that he had done mm. for me, that it was too hard. And then I gave up and I had to quit, that I wasn't dead, that nothing bad happened and I wasn't broken. I was physically able to continue. I just didn't want to because it was hard <laughs> and I couldn't do it. Uh, and, and so I, that, that was my thing. That's what got me through that, that experience in, in the worst moments. That was the thing that I thought of and talking to other friends who went through, uh, there were a lot of similar experiences. Like uh, I grew up with a, a friend of mine named Marshall who became a scout sniper in the Marine Corps. And they have a, a similar selection course. It's really brutal. And we'd never talked about it until he'd been out of the Marines for a couple of years. And I asked him about this and he lived on a, a cattle ranch and South Dakota winters and calving season is, is kind of a terrible time of year because you have to go out in the middle of the night in the terrible cold in, the, in a blizzard and check calves and make sure they're alive because that's your family's livelihood. So you go out and walk mm -hmm. around in the fields and check calves. And Marshall's dad would wear this jacket, a canvas Carhartt jacket that was just destroyed, covered in duct tape and patches and whatever. And he'd wear that over like five other things to stay warm. And he would go out in the middle of the night while his family was sleeping and check calves, come back in and get some sleep before morning. And that, when Marshall was in scout sniper selection and taking his beatings, that's what he pictured on his worst day. He thought about that jacket as a representation of, of suffering. And, and that was something that, you know, his dad never volunteered his way out of. He didn't quit. And so he wasn't going to either. And, and that was a pretty universal thing talking to other guys who make it through special forces or SAS or SEAL training or whatever. Um, most of them can bring it back to some particular moment or value system that was instilled in them that usually has to do with parents or a mentor of some sort and and usually sacrifices made by someone else for you mm -hmm. um and yeah it, i i think that's that's a really important thing especially for people who are going to do something like that or even if you're not in the military but you're still going through a really difficult time to to spend mm -hmm. some time thinking about what that thing is for you and to keep that in mind when when everything else is kind of kind of lost mm -hmm. So role mo so with my list I'm making here, uh, so, so the tips I want to give to people uh, from what we've learned from you today is uh, from the precision nutrition straight up, it's just that sl slow down to eat and you can add in my other little bits about sitting down to eat. That's my contribution yeah, to good. this. Pretty much that's all. So we sit down to eat and then eat slower, you know, savor the foods and that sort of stuff and really appreciate those meals. Routine is more important than just mm. trying to focus on routine and, and consistency rather than motivation and intensity. Try to play every day, add movement to sedentary lifestyle. Um, try to enjoy your exercise and don't make your exercise a stress. And I think that fits back in with the playing aspect. Mm. Whole foods is better than eating crap. Kind of simple one. Um, it's it, it, role models and mentors and that sort of stuff can also be highly beneficial towards your mentoring. And it's not necessarily just like having the picture of an Arnold Schwarzenegger on the wall, you know, um, or having a vision board um, and that sort of stuff. Some of those practical things of people that have confirmed to you consistency and routine and that sort of stuff, you know, trying to, so that, that sounds important. Mm. Um, of course, we know sleeping is important and trying mm. to avoid stress, but I'm so glad because what you're talking about because i'm just so sick of all the angst and intensity and judging in the world it's so nice to hear that you can actually get results by doing something um, when you were doing nothing you don't have to go full mental you know right at the start to be able to achieve any change um longer term you know i look over mm. for results over a year rather mm. than you know 12 months versus 12 weeks um with your campaigns i think we've got some really good 
tips for guys that's here. Up, you that's know? amazing. And have you got any others you would add to that? I mean, we've been through a bit. Any other quick ones you want to sort of finish up with? Any other tips that aren't mentioned there? Yeah, there's one actually. Um, you were saying something earlier that that uh, reminded me of it. But uh, we have an article that, that I could send you called on trigger workouts, and it's related oh. to that sprinkling movement throughout your day thing or, or oh, yeah. like Matt was saying every 50 to 55 minutes add five to 10 minutes of just moving around um there's something it's been around in a bunch of different forms for 30 40 years at least um Pavel Sotsaline called it greasing the groove there are oh. Russian guys or, or Eastern European guys I think doing it well before that but the we did it in the military as a way of getting better at push-ups and pull-ups where every 20, 30 minutes, every hour or whatever, we would have a timer go off and we just do a couple reps of push-ups or pull-ups or whatever we're trying to get better at. And the idea of the trigger is to put something in your immediate view, somewhere that you're going to see that's going to serve as a reminder for you. Like I have on the other side of this laptop, a, a couple of kettlebells sitting on the floor that are between the kitchen and the bathroom, like in the normal oh walkway oh, yeah. and every time i walk by i do a handful of something like 5 10 15 reps of squats or presses or swings or whatever oh. um and the idea is to to use stuff like that um just mixed in throughout your day you can structure it use a use a timer or something like that or just every time you walk to the bathroom or every time you walk out of this door or something like that you'll add a couple of reps of something and mm. it's it's a way there was something else you guys were talking about that that ties into this, um, but of keeping your body like at least somewhat accustomed to regular physical movement. Mm. And like, there's a physiological value to that as well in terms of, you know, glut for translocation and, and mm. local metabolic issues and how your body's handling glucose and that kind of thing. It's also really beneficial for your joints, all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, but you can use, I'll, I'll send you the article on it, but, but you can use mm. trigger workouts as a way of just mixing in a little bit of extra activity throughout your day. And you can do it in a way that you're not going to get sweaty. You're not going to be breathing really hard. You don't have to worry about changing clothes. I oh, know um, you're talking. And you can kind of mix it into anything. And, it, and yeah. it's, a, it's a good way to stay fairly active. Um, there are some days where that's all I do. You know, I'll, I think I'll, that's really important. Who that's knows how many 15 sets of something. Um, and I don't do a normal hour-long workout. I just, every time I walk past something, I, I do some pull-ups or push-ups or do whatever. Yeah. And that's, um, and that's the other one, realistic, you know. Yeah, we could do that in the yeah, office. Yeah, we walk past the post and you got to do five push-ups. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah, in the military, the common yeah. thing is having a pull-up bar outside. Um, everybody has a pull-up bar outside their door for whatever reason in the military. Yeah, right. And it's just a normal thing you get used to, that every time you walk in or out of the house, you do a couple pull-ups. And by the end of the we day, maybe you've done really 50 high. reps. <laughs> so we, that, we, I, we just uh, built a new factory. We should have built it with all our doors, like above head height. So every time you had to get into a door, you had to like climb, climb over it. it. Yeah, do some step ups on the ladder. Hey, now you're talking about this. I'm going to put a ninja behind my door. Anytime someone comes to visit me, they just got to work their way through the ninja. You remember the Pink Panther? He had to do it every time we went home and he yeah. got attacked by a okay, No, man. I've put my sons into Muay Thai. It's like I'm living in the Pink Panther <laughs> movie. I come home. I come home and these guys, I just, all I, and I went to their coach and I said to him, just like teach them not to attack the nuts <laughs> constantly. Like I can. I can handle the element of surprise with a little six-year-old ninja popping out, but it's it's when they go straight for the kidney beans. Yeah, they will never get you. Them when they're five and six, yeah. <laughs> oh god, we. I, I think that's it. We, 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 as soon as you bring up nuts, we, it it's, must be getting close to time. We might have to finish off. I think, and, <laughs> you know, it's 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 one of one of those sort of signals when we when we start to talk about the sort of things we should sort of wrap things up. But I, I think it's a good thing. Well, you call a nut in your house. <laughs> yeah, two of the little bastards, Buggers, <laughs> rascals, ninjas, ninjas. There you go, children, darlings, <laughs> two, two of the little darlings. So I go, so they're so different. How's this? Their first day of Mu Muay Thai. I keep saying it wrong. Muay Thai. They're getting mad at me for saying Muay Thai. And I go, Muay Thai. Muay Thai. So it was, he, one of my sons, he's like all nervous and like shy and that sort of stuff. You know, floppy arms and bad posture. And the, and the other kid struts in and he, he goes up to the coach and I saw him talking in the middle of the class. I come up and asked him later, what were you talking to the coach about in the middle of the class? He was asking the coach which trophies were his. Mm. Um, and then the coach pointed out on the wall, the big one on the wall. And here's my six-year-old kid on his first day of class. He goes, I'll fight you for it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, good on you, dude. 
was, that, uh, it was Henry, was it? That was Henry, oh, of course. Yes, yeah. Of course it was. So, um, yeah, but we have run out of time. Yeah, we have. Um, we better wrap it up. I reckon yeah. we've got some wicked tips. It's yeah. going to be a really cool bloggy thing that comes with this, and mm-hmm. we'll link to all of these other articles and everything as well. Um, share the love, I reckon. And trigger workouts. I love it. I look forward that, to I'm excited some. about yes. that. Yes, I reckon we should implement it here. Yeah, well, we, we, that's why I'm excited, it's Steve. So, like, what do you think? It's just all about me. Yep. This whole company and podcast, the product, everything is about me trying to resolve my issues. <laughs> so this is another great idea of something that I need to do for me. <laughs> and I need a whole team of people around me to motivate me yep. until I get consistent. That's the, well, well, Craig, thank you for your time. I've noticed the sunset behind you. It's been, you know, obviously that time of day for you. So thank you so much for being part of this. And hopefully we'll see you soon on the on the podcast series again. And uh, you know we would love your tips. I loved hearing about the SWUC oh. and and everything like that. And, and I, also I want to hear about Hell Week next time. No, Craig is I oh, was teasing us up. He's mentioned all sorts of stuff oh, like no. mitochondrial biogenesis, yes. glute four translocation. He's listing all this stuff that he knows we want to talk more about as yeah. well. So I do want to get talk more to Craig about all that sort of stuff because mm-hmm. I want to get can, right down into the science. Yeah, we, we can do a nerd talk if you guys... Yeah, nerd a talk. Bit, bit of nerd porn. Yes. We'll do that. Is, uh, <laughs> well, 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 thank you, Craig, for giving up your time, and, and we've loved having you on. So I guess from us, it's it's goodbye, and from Matt, I guess it's... Oh, it's goodbye as well. Goodbye as well, obviously. Probably Craig would be really weird if he said hello now. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of, <laughs> better be a goodbye as well. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, thanks, guys. Um, I'll thank send you, you a follow thanks, with right. that trigger workouts thing, and uh, we'll stay in touch. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. and then we'll do our thing. I'm not sure what happens from here. Yeah, we'll be in touch. But, yeah, that <laughs> Brooko will handle it and Vanessa, who knows what else. We know, we don't even know what he does. <laughs> but, all right, thanks, Craig. All right, thanks. thank you. I'll take you guys later. Bye. 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 Bye.